Earlier this year, I put out a video on power hitting giant Frank Howard. He was primarily known for his towering home runs during his time with the Washington Senators. Tragically, he passed away during this year's World Series, just mere days before his beloved organization would win it. The Senators became the Rangers during his tenure there. Frank stood at 6 foot 7. His play and weight started around 255 his rookie season but was nearing 300 later in his career. This is a frame that, to no surprise, generated plenty of breathtaking home runs to the outer limits of RFK Stadium, a hitter's park. Very few highlights are available of those Senators teams, but these moonshots have withstood the test of time. In the National League, the same phenomenon exists where footage of a 60s expansion team is very sparse. This is the Houston Colt 45 slash Astros. Outside of a team history documentary published following their storied 1986 season, very little footage exists of these early Astros teams. MLB Film Room has uploaded three clips from the summer of 1967, which stand as their only Houston clips of that decade. Don Wilson's final pitch during the first no-hitter in the Astrodome, and there's two clips of Jimmy Wynn sending baseballs into orbit that stand as arguably the furthest hit balls in these respective historic parks. The first was a June 11th cold-blooded murder of a baseball at Crosley Field against the Reds that went over the scoreboard and onto the highway. The second, which took place a little over a month later, July 23rd, was a bomb that showcased a weird feature at Pittsburgh's Forbes Field when it sailed over the on-field batting cage and over the center field wall that stood at 457 feet from home plate. That season, Jimmy Wynn would hit 37 home runs to Frank Howard's 36. What a remarkable feat for a man who stood at just 5 foot 9 and was 160 pounds soaking wet. Because he could muster such power from his diminutive frame, Houston Chronicle sports writer John Wilson began referring to Jimmy Wynn as the Toy Cannon. That same season, this was backed by Jim Murray of the LA Times, who's often regarded as the best sports writer to ever live. He colorfully explained the name fit because pitchers who expected to be hit with a cork with a string on it suddenly found an 88mm howitzer opening up on them. Wynn was initially reluctant to embrace this nickname, but it was just too good. I gotta figure out how to make money on this thing. It's simply too good. Jimmy Wynn was born on March 12, 1942 in Cincinnati, just a few blocks from Crosley Field where one of his career-defining homers would be hit. He had fond memories of watching Reds players walk by his house to and from home games. He credited his father, Joseph, for his love of the game. Joseph had formerly played semi-pro ball and was active as Jimmy's Little League coach. Jimmy Wynn was a standout multiple sport athlete at Robert A. Taft High School. He was a teammate of Walter Johnson's. To clarify, this was not the legendary pitcher, Big Train Walter Johnson, an inaugural member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. This was football defensive tackle Walter Johnson, who spent the majority of his career with the Cleveland Browns. The Cincinnati Reds signed Jimmy Wynn when he graduated from high school. However, he chose to attend Central State University after admonition from his mother. He was a two-sport standout in baseball and basketball. The Reds came calling again in the spring of 1962. This time he'd sign and depart for Tampa to play in the Class D Florida League. He was primarily a third baseman at that time. This would be the 20-year-old Wynn's first exposure to the harsh racism that would haunt the black players of that era, but he credits his managers Johnny Vandermeer and Hirsch Freeman for their ethical treatment of everyone in that dugout. For more on this subject, there are great first-hand stories from Wynn and many other integration era players in this documentary. It's currently free to view here on YouTube. At that time, first-year players could be drafted by other teams if they were not protected on that respective team's 40-man roster. The Astros would claim Wynn, and though he surely had aspirations of suiting up for his hometown team, he'd have a fast track to the show through a Houston organization facing growing pains in their first few years of operation. He'd begin the 1963 season with the San Antonio Bullets, and by July he'd be in the big leagues. He'd hit his first of 291 career home runs on July 14th. Manager Harry Kraft would pencil win into the lineup at center field on July 23rd, a position he'd owned for years to come. 
come. He made history as a part of an all-rookie lineup that Kraft would roll out on September 27th. It would also feature Rusty Staub and Joe Morgan in the infield. The Astrodome would open in 1965 and Wynn would begin to create his reputation with the bat. Though his home and road splits would serve as a shining example of how hard the dome was on hitters. He'd bat 305 with 15 home runs on the road and just 247 with 7 home runs at home. This season would be cut short on August 1st when he broke both his left wrist and elbow, crashing into the center field wall in pursuit of a Dick Allen line drive. He'd miss a portion of the 66 season as well, but he'd return for an absolutely incredible 1967 season that saw him attend his first All-Star game. He became the first player to hit three home runs in a single game at the Astrodome on June 16th. Each one traveled over 400 feet. The next few seasons, Wynn's stats would decline, which according to Joe Morgan's book, could be attributed to new manager Harry Walker attempting to alter his swing. Walter was not a popular manager to say the least, he'd eventually be replaced by Leo DeRocher. Wynn would return to form in 1970, hitting a home run that reached the yellow seats in left field. Staff would paint a cannon on the seat it landed in to commemorate it. Following that season, Wynn would be stabbed in the stomach by his wife during a domestic dispute. He would undergo abdominal surgery and subsequently go through a divorce. A change of scenery was definitely in order. Jimmy Wynn was traded to the Dodgers for Claude Osteen in 1973. His hitting coach would become none other than Dixie Walker, his former manager Harry's brother, who notably had a fantastic relationship with Wynn, and his career was officially rejuvenated en route to the Dodgers winning 102 games and the pennant in 1974. Wynn would hit this big home run off of Raleigh Fingers in the World Series and finish fifth in MVP voting. He'd also notch the highest war of his career for those who celebrate. The Dodgers would trade Jimmy Wynn to Atlanta following the 1974 season. He'd also briefly suit up for the Yankees and Brewers before stepping away in 1977. The Houston fan favorite was very active in retirement. The toy cannon was ahead of his time in several ways, but playing the game in a way that earned him some style points is most definitely evident in today's game. Wynn would play entire games with a toothpick in his mouth, which seemed to infuriate National League pitching. Many threatened to knock it out of his mouth, but according to Wynn, none ever did. <laughs>